in church. Good morning to those who found us online. Maybe that's where most everyone is this morning. Welcome, welcome. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We say to ourselves, the Lord is our portion, therefore we will wait for him. Father, draw us close to your heart. We open our hearts to you and invite you to search our hearts, renew our spirits, bring us into alignment with your spirit. Thank you for the new work you continually do in each of us. We're here, Father God, to hear you. We're here, Father God, to sense you and your presence. We're here to be touched and changed by you, Father. Reveal to us any area that we are not in agreement with you and your word. We pray for deep revelation and understanding of your truth today and all days. We trust you, Lord Jesus. We love that we can open our hearts to you. We know that your love is unconditional, everlasting. So as you spring forth a new thing in us, in Greenwoods, in the global church, Father, we're excited and expectant of your goodness in this new and exciting season. Thank you, Father. Prepare all of us for the new and wonderful things you have for our lives and the life of our church. Help us to let go of old things that hold us back, the things that don't bring life, the things that keep us looking behind to the past. We promise to cling to our new identity, our new vision in Christ, the new thing you're now working in Greenwood. So help us to keep moving forward in our journey with you and we know you're with us every step of the way. We thank you and praise you in the wonderful, saving name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Let's just take a moment and say hi to each other. <laughs> hi. As we're able, let's, let's stand and, and worship together.
like a fair find my wandering heart to prone to wonder Lord I fear prone to leave the God I love here's my heart take and see seal it for can see, seal it for that court of As we're seated, let's continue in prayer. Father God, here are our hearts. Take and seal them for thy courts above, Father God. Father, there's so much weight I think we feel when we come to prayer with you. Um, there's really a burden for so much that we need to pray for. It's hard to even know where to begin. But Father, all you ask is just that we come as we are, whether we have words or not, just to make time and space for you and you promise to meet us. You're always listening. You're always with us. You're always attentive. And we take comfort remembering that, especially in those times we don't have the words, if we just come, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf what we cannot. That alone is a miracle. That alone is love and grace. Amazing that you communicate for us even when we don't think we can. So Father, we make space for you now. Hear your children, hear our concert of prayer. There are things to be grateful for, but there's also a burden that we have as your stewards of this world to bring the world's cries to you. That's a burden we shoulder. So we love you. We make time for you. Hear the cries of your children, Father God. Hear our concert of prayer. Father, thank you for this new day, this day filled with sunshine and snow, with brightness of your mercy show. Come before you, Lord, worship you, and I pray that as we worship you, we're strengthened. We're here to praise you, Lord, and I pray that we would come before you as an almighty God, that we, Lord, would know that you are in control of things, that we would know, Father God, that your love is now. I pray, Father, for those who are here today, who ventured out into the cold and snow, Lord, to 
person. Pray, Father, our blessing upon each and every one of us. And I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come. As in so many places in this world, there's no opportunity to come and see the Lord by yourself when you come in a cave or basement of a building. There's no fortune here in America to be able to come and openly worship you. Just pray, Father, that whatever fear is keeping us away from doing that, Lord, would just be dissolved by your great power. Pray this in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we today word of praise and thank you for the prayers and concerns that went out by Brother James, who was well on his way to recovery, Lord. We hope to see him home within a few days. Lord, and I just lift up all the doctors and nurses in the hospitals, and especially those people, Lord, who are lying in beds with no, no one to advocate for them, no one to hold their hand, no one to soothe them. But Lord, be their advocate. Be their advocate and comfort them all. And Lord, we, we know that the doctors and nurses are extremely busy, and things can get violent that they're totally unaware of. Lord, we just ask you to, to bless them. Was willing to be there, Lord, and I thank you for the caregivers, my brother, who are willing to go in and sit with them and be with them in the times when I could not. Lord, you're an awesome God. We just thank you so much for my being able to feel comfort and peace in that you were there. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray for Rosa Hubbard. I ask, Lord, that you would provide relief from the pain that she's experiencing. Lord, give her courage, give her hope. Lord, give the doctors wisdom to know how to best uh, treat her pain. I pray also for John, you provide such tender care for her. We ask that you would give him strength, give him endurance, and we give you all the glory.
Father, we thank you for the words that your son gave us in the Lord's Prayer. Timeless words from your mouth, Lord, from thousands of years ago, still relevant and powerful today. As your people, Lord, may we hold fast to these words and may we be changed by them every time we pray them. May they be new on, on your ears from our mouths, Father God. So we pray them as your people, online, here in person, around the world, we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we started last week, we're taking the next few weeks to actually talk through the Lord's prayer, phrase by phrase. N.T. Wright has written a fabulous book called The Lord and His Prayer, which serves as the inspiration for these next few weeks. And I love that we pray the Lord's Prayer every week. I love it, but it's also too easy for these words to become stale, dare I say, stagnant, familiar, expected. And, and I hope as we're learning that, that we're realizing that, that this prayer is anything but expected or stale, anything but those descriptors. As we're beginning to learn, this prayer is powerful. It's, it's revolutionary in every sense. It's, it's rebellious even. It's defiant to all things ordinary and expected, counterintuitive to the way things work here on earth. And these words are stronghold shattering. We need this prayer, don't we? We need this prayer recontextualized because we're in crisis globally, nationally, individually. God's global church is in crisis. Greenwood's is in crisis. And this prayer, our Lord's prayer, is for a time such as this. And, and I'm continuing to call us to 10-4 prayer. You know, are you remembering to do this? Remember, 10-4 is an affirmative signal, it means okay, it means information received, I'm on my way. So 10-4 prayers, just, it's a daily check-in with God on Greenwood's behalf. Yes, God, 10-4, I understand the church is in crisis, so I'm checking in with you. What can I do to help, Father? I'm listening. Is there something you need me to do to help Greenwood's community church? 10-4, God. I'm here, willing and able to help. I'd like to thank Warren Prindle for reminding me of, of the Hebrew equivalent of 10-4 prayer, the Hineni prayer. It literally means, Lord, here I am. I'm ready. And, and, and this is precisely what we're doing with 10-4 prayer. Uh, here's what a Jewish scholar says of the word Hineni. Uh, when God called Moses out from the burning bush, Moses replied, Hineni. And you know what assignment he was given and what happened next when God approached Abraham, asked him to offer his only son as a sacrifice. Abraham responded, Hineni, not knowing what God was about to ask. God called out to the young boy Samuel three times before Samuel finally responded, Hineni. I'm listening. You know, many hundreds of years later, God asked who would go for him in Isaiah 6, and the prophet willingly offered himself with a cry of, Hineni, send me. And this Jewish scholar goes on, it can be used by family members, ready to be available, ready to pay attention, ready to obey instructions, a bit like turning up and reporting for duty. It's like 10 4, right? Some translations include a behold. You know, behold, look, Father, I'm here, emphasizing that they are present and ready for action. Children often say it as an expression of readiness to submit to their parents' requests. 
So thank you, Warren Prindle, for this awesome reminder. 10-4 serves as a reminder for each of us that at 10 a.m., 4 p.m., no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, I'm just calling us to take a moment to pray for Greenwood's future and stability, and it doesn't have to be long and lengthy. It's a check-in. Pray for a clear vision for Greenwood's stability in, in finances, in attendance, and membership, and thriving worship. And then ask God how you can be a part of his vision for Greenwoods. 10 a.m., 4 p.m. If you have to adjust and tweak it, that's okay. Don't worry. It could be 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. one day, 11 a.m., 6 p.m. another day. And if you miss a time, don't worry. It's okay. There's grace. Stop for a moment. Check in with God. And the point is to prioritize prayer. Each and every one of us, God's people at Greenwoods. And the inspiration, I love the message translation of 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, my God-defined people, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, turning their backs on their wicked lives, I'll be there ready, says God. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins, restore their land and health. From now on, the God says, I'm alert day and night to the prayers offered. It's a promise. Set reminders in your phone, your computer, your watches, your tablets, 10 a.m., 4 p.m. Because here's the truth, friends. Here's, here's the promise. Because the reality is when God's people collectively and, and, and wholeheartedly pray and choose to seek him together at specific times, he moves. He moves in powerful ways. He acts, and scripture promises that. Those watching online, set it in your computers, your phones. These cards are printed and on the table out there. You can print them. I've emailed them to all of us. They're even on the website, on the home page. We can all do this. So back to the Lord's Prayer. Briefly, last week, we explored what it means to pray our Father in heaven and what it means to hallow and, and revere his name. Calling God our Father, Abba, is, is so much more than the daddy imagery we've been taught, although that is extremely correct and important. You know, when the Israelites were exiled, they cried to their Abba, for liberation, for freedom of slavery. Stop the injustice, Ava, of our people. And this was from the lips of his children, his sons and daughters. Yes, scripture promised that they would be freed at a certain time in the future, but they were crying out, Abba, Father, let it be now. Let it be now. And so is God's people now. We're exiled, sons and daughters of God. Yes, in this strange culture and strange land that has drifted so far from him. We join in that Abba cry for the new exodus, right? When he will show up and finally free us and free the world from the oppression and tyranny of sin, evil, and Satan. Our Father in heaven, may your name be proclaimed holy now. Come now to free us and finally set things right. At the same time, Abba's a cry for salvific fulfillment of God's children, that God would remember his people who've been saved by his name, that as our Abba finally shows up and frees us, that he fulfills his promise to us of living with him on earth, the promise of heaven and earth overlapping and, and, and married in existence. We join in that cry today, don't we? that Jesus would come now in the second advent. Our Father in heaven, whose name is holy and sovereign, may all of creation, all of the cosmos you created, cry out in reverence to you, our Abba creator. May your kingdom come now. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean to pray that? Here's what N.T. Wright says, heaven and earth are two interlocking arenas of God's good world. Heaven is God's space where God's order and authority runs. God's future purposes are, are waiting in the wings. 
Earth is our world, our space. Think of the vision, N.T. Wright says, at the end of Revelation. It isn't about human beings being snatched up from earth to heaven. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes down from heaven to earth. God's space and ours finally married, integrated at last. And that's what we pray for when we pray, thy kingdom come. Jesus' contemporaries were longing for God to become king. Putting it bluntly, they were fed up with the other kings that they'd had long endured. And as far as they were concerned, the Roman emperors were a curse. The Herodian dynasty was a joke. It was time for the true God, the true king, to step into history, to take the power and the glory, to claim the kingdom for his own. The prophets had promised it. Ezekiel, Yahweh himself, will come to be the shepherd of Israel. Zechariah, Yahweh will come and all his saints with him. Malachi, with just a tinge of warning, right? The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And towering over them all, Isaiah, there will be a highway in the wilderness. The valleys and, and mountains will be flattened out. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed in all flesh, so shall see it together. Zion hears her watchmen shouting, here is your God. Isaiah's message holds together the, the majesty and the, and the gentleness of this God who arrives in power and who at once shows up to feed his flock like a shepherd carrying the lambs. This is the kingdom message that Jesus lived by. This prophetic vision is the basis of the Lord's prayer. But what will it mean when Israel's God returns to be king? According to the same prophetic passages, there will be a new exodus. The evil empire will finally be defeated and God's people will be free. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to Isaiah 52, verse 7 through 10, because this passage would at once be recalled in the minds of the first century Jews when Jesus talked about God's kingdom arriving. Isaiah says, How delightful it is to see approaching over the mountains the feet of a messenger who announces peace, a messenger who brings good news, who announces deliverance, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen shout in unison. They shout for joy, for they see with their very own eyes the Lord's return to Zion. In unison, give a joyful shout, O ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord consoles his people. He protects Jerusalem. The Lord reveals his royal power in the sight of all the nations. The entire earth sees our God deliver. Wow, what a promise, what a vision. So in light of this, was Jesus' message and ministry political? How do we respond to that question? No, no, absolutely not. Jesus, Jesus was an evangelical, a Christian pastor. He didn't talk about politics, and neither do we. Jesus' ministry is all about spiritual renewal and personal salvation, which we actually keep that to ourselves, too. Really? Well, I mean, in light of this passage, in light of praying for God's holy kingdom to radically and really forcefully enter this world, all at once to, to terminate and annihilate the devil's lustful grasp of this world in government, in, in world leaders, in media, and, and entertainment, in business, and finance, and... and and politics yes friends family let's just let me take a moment and get some things clear of course jesus ministry absolutely is about one's spiritual renewal and salvation absolutely we all have to take time to get back to and get right with god through the son absolutely but jesus life and ministry was and is absolutely political it is to boil his life and mission and the Bible down to quiet personal well-being and feel-goodery is ridiculous. It's, it's nonsensical, and, and really, 
I don't use this word lightly. It's ignorant and sinful. Jesus was a revolutionary, and what he preached was and is a radical way, a new way of thinking and living and loving. Jesus' ministry is also about social justice. I'm sorry to ruffle feathers and confronting systemic corrupt human systems of privileged authority and stale, whitewashed, pompous self-righteousness. Period. And if you've missed that, if you've missed that, you've missed the heart of the gospel. You've missed the entire meta-narrative of the Bible because praying the Lord's Prayer is all about pleading with God to remember his promises, to set everything right, to liberate his captive children from the seductive abuse of the devil and sin, to finally tear down and incinerate corrupt, deceitful leaders, the immoral, unethical systems seduced by sin and evil in our nation and all over the world. Abba, Father, please, enough of all this evil. Let it all be done now. Free us from all this. Come now, Abba. So what do we do now then? Won't we pray this prayer fervently, friends? We pray this prayer. We learn and understand what it means to pray this prayer and pray through it. We get trusted information from dependable, reliable sources. We gather to worship. We gather to worship God collectively, wholeheartedly, authentically, emotionally, lovingly, boldly. Should I speak out against things, Pastor? If God leads you to, yes. If God leads you to, yes, at the very least, you should pray to be ready to speak out. If God puts a word on your heart to speak and you're afraid, it's okay. I am. I'm terrified. Grab one of us to stand with you, but speak. We all need to be ready to speak. You know what's missing in all this noise around us? Us. <laughs> We're missing friends. We, God's people, speaking boldly and, and confidently, lovingly, and respectively, collectively into the cacophony of lies, deceit, and delusion. Tom Wright says, when Jesus teaches us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's about something that actually happens. It really is. It's about something that actually happens within this time-space world. But equally, Jesus' parables regularly challenge the simple, one-dimensional, liberationist kingdom vision that his contemporaries cherished. If Isaiah's message is about God's healing for the nations, about Israel being the light of the world, this will not be achieved by military victory. To put it crudely, how can the Prince of Peace defeat evil if he has to abandon peace itself in order to do so. No, Jesus took the three parts of Isaiah's kingdom message and set about implementing them. Release for the captive Israel, the defeat of evil, the return of Yahweh to Zion. Release for the captive Israel, the defeat of evil, the return of Yahweh to Zion. So thus, as revolutionary and radical as these messages are, I believe we would all agree that equally and to the same degree, our Abba Father is also about surprising and, and seemingly his counterintuitiveness the way his messages are communicated and relate to us as his people. Here's what I mean. Let's look at each of these elements to God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. What is release for the captive Israel? Well, we're all familiar with the parable of the prodigal or the lost son. Yes, it's been the focus of several of the sermons we've heard here. And the implications are personal and powerful even for us today, praise God. No matter how far we stray, our Abba, our Father in heaven will always welcome us home. Or if we focus on the father in the parable, there's no distance he isn't willing to travel to meet us and welcome us home, no matter how far we've strayed. And these implications are just as true for us today as they were for those who first heard them from Jesus' lips. 
But would you believe me if I told you that those were not the foremost implication in the minds of the early Jews? In addition to those implications we hear, they would have been thinking more about the Abba Father imagery we're trying to get back to, the new exodus, the liberation of captive Israel. But Jesus, in telling the parable of the lost son, the prodigal son, wasn't issuing a call to arms in the struggle for liberty. He was explaining why he was constantly celebrating the kingdom with outcasts and misfits, people on the fringes. Somehow, he seemed to be saying that through this strange work, the kingdom was appearing, even though it didn't look like what people had imagined. This was how the captives were being released. The defeat of evil. All throughout Jesus' ministry and teachings, his, his miracles, his healings, Jesus was somehow showing everyone that sin and evil's long reign and, and hold was finally being abolished. How else could Jesus do what he was doing, right? Wherever he went, somehow in his words and actions, sin and, and the devil's curse were miraculously being undone. Isaiah's kingdom message promised defeat for the evil regime which had enslaved God's people. Woven into that message in Isaiah, we find four poems about a strange character, the servant of the Lord, who will be God's agent in accomplishing this task. The prophecy as a whole, which you can find in Isaiah 40 through 55, sets out the promise of the kingship of God. The servant songs within it set out a job description for how the promise is to be realized. Jesus volunteered for the job. This, he believed, was how evil would be defeated. And the return of Yahweh to Zion. Thirdly, Isaiah had declared that Yahweh himself would return to his people, coming with power and justice, coming gentle as a shepherd. Jesus spoke of his own work in the same terms. He frequently explained what he was doing in, in terms and imagery of a shepherd rescuing lost sheep. He told stories about a king or a master returning to his servants to see what they were up to. And Jesus spoke and acted as if he was called to embody not just the return from exile, not just the defeat of evil, but also, astonishingly, the return of Yahweh to his people. So Jesus then embraced a crazy and utterly seemingly ridiculous vocation, right? Risky. And when he taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, he wanted them to pray that he would succeed in it. That prayer astonishingly was answered. You know, they thought it hadn't been, but Easter proved them wrong. Those first followers, Jesus' first followers, to their own great surprise, quickly came to believe that, wow, so God's kingdom had come. His will had been done in Palestine, in Jerusalem, Calvary, and now in the Easter Garden. Heaven and earth had finally dovetailed together. The prophecies had been fulfilled, though not at all in the way they expected. That's usually how God works. So praying thy kingdom come, thy will be done, isn't comfy and cozy or safe. No, not at all. And the disciples were first to witness how strong and bold and dangerous this prayer is. Could you imagine being in their shoes, their sandals, <laughs> with Jesus actually risen? And, and that realization that, that God's kingdom was finally actually entering the world. Could you imagine that all of God's creation, the cosmos, everything had finally taken that, turned that cataclysmic corner, right, from darkness, wow, to light. Their world was literally rocked. And you know, ours should be too. If we're really praying the Lord's Prayer, if we're believing what we're praying all throughout every time we pray it our world should continue to be rocked friends 
So invariably, here are some questions that have been asked for millennia. Why is there still injustice? Why does evil still seem to have a hold on this world of God's kingdoms entering in finally? Why are people still starving? Why is there still war, still prejudice, still oppression, still devastation? These are really good questions, important questions, and if we're honest, unavoidable questions that can't be answered with easy answers, glossed over, casual confrontation. No, I think those first disciples, those first followers would say to keep praying and living the Lord's Prayer. And maybe that does at first sound too casual, too easy, too glossed over. But I think by saying this, to pray the Lord's Prayer, they weren't avoiding these questions. They were answering those questions head on. And I pray that we realize this too as God's people. We must carry on, friends. We must press on by continuing to devotedly and believingly pray this prayer. Why? Why should we trust our Lord in this prayer? Because Jesus uniquely, powerfully, triumphantly did what he did. He did. Once and for all, and that fact, that reality, radically, undeniably changed everything. That's how we mark our calendars. Once and for all. Amen? Tom Wright says to think of it this way. Jesus is the medical genius who discovered penicillin. We are doctors. Ourselves, we have to be cured by the penicillin first, right? And maybe we need another dose, a booster. I don't want to get into that anymore. Uh, now, but now we need to apply it to those who need it. And we know it works, right? We know it works. It's from heaven. Jesus is the musical genius who wrote the greatest oratorio of all time. We are the musicians tuning our instruments, ready to play, captivated by his composition ourselves. We now perform it to teach the world, which is full of elevator music and Muzak, right? The kingdom did indeed come with Jesus, but it will fully come when the world is healed, when the whole creation finally joins in the song. But it must be Jesus' medicine. It must be Jesus' music. And the only way to be sure of that is to pray this prayer, friends. That's how we tune our instruments. That's how we take the medicine so that others can trust us to take it when we offer it to them. What then might it mean to pray this kingdom prayer today? It means for a start that as we look up into the face of our Father in heaven and commit ourselves to the hallowing of his name, that we look immediately out upon the whole world that he made. And we see it as he sees it. We need to recalibrate our vision, don't we? Thy kingdom come. To pray this means seeing the world in binocular vision. See it with the love of the creator for his spectacularly beautiful creation. And at the same time, see it with the deep grief of the creator for the battered and battered, scarred state in which the world now finds itself. And we put those two together and bring the binocular picture into focus. The love and the grief join into what? The Jesus shape, the kingdom shape, the cross shape. Never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine. And with this Jesus before our eyes, pray again, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are praying as Jesus was praying and acting for the redemption of the world, for the radical defeat and uprooting of, of evil, and for heaven and earth to be married at last, for God to be all in all, once and for all. And if we pray this way, we must, of course, be, pre pre be prepared to live this way, to walk this way. 
So as we pray this for the world, we also pray it, of course, for the church. But this cannot mean that we simply want God to sort out our messes, right? God, clean up the muddles so that the church can be a cozy place once again without problems or pain. We can only pray this prayer for the church if we are prepared to mean this. Make us, Father God, kingdom bearers. Make us a community of healed healers. Make us a retuned orchestra to play the kingdom music until the world takes up the song. And we're told it will. We're told it will. Make us, in turn, servants of the Lord, the few with the message for the many. Quite a calling. So praying thy will be done, it isn't praying a prayer of resignation. Resignation, you know what I mean? We don't pray, God, thy will be done with a shrug of the shoulders. As if to say, well, what I want really doesn't matter much. If God really wants to do something, I suppose I can put up with it and deal with it. Thy will be done. You know, that might do if God were a remote, detached God, but it won't do for Isaiah's God, the God that we're learning more about in this short series, right? It won't do for Jesus. It won't do for those who break bread and, and, and drink from his cup to remember Jesus and pray for the kingdom. No, this is the risky, crazy prayer of submission and commission. Or if you like the prayer of subversion and conversion. It is the way we sign on in our turn for the work of the kingdom. Hineni, here I am. It's the way we take the medicine ourselves so that we may be strong enough to administer it to others. It's the way we retune our instruments to play God's oratorio so the world can remember how it sings. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can we pray this then and expect our Abba's kingdom to come now and his will to be done now on earth if we won't let his kingdom and his will be done on, on this earth? We're made of this earth. Right? We're lumps of clay. We're crafted from this earth by our Creator. So when we pray this prayer, we must allow ourselves to be changed, to be overtaken by His heavenly reign and rule. Amen? I mean, for if we're not willing to include ourselves in this radical, revolutionary reign on earth, then I think we've missed the heart of this prayer, friends. Indeed, Abba, Father, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father God, why don't we just pray the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you all come back. <laughs> I'm having good time with this series. Let me pray for our, our, our offerings. <clears throat> Father God, we ask your blessing upon these gifts we've brought today, during the week, with us now, online, through the mail, Father God. Please bless and multiply these gifts. We offer our gifts, Father God, our first fruits, because we invest in you and we're hoping and, and investing for more of you in the days to come. As you continue to instill your vision with Greenwoods, 
and then our commissioned call as your church through missionaries and connecting with other churches, Father God, we choose to invest in what you're doing now. A more compassionate world, a, a time of peace, a world that's healed by the medicine you offer, a world that joins into your kingdom chorus and orchestra, Father God. And we each have a unique voice and instrument to join in with, Father God. Shape us, tune us through the way we give, for we are tuned more into useful instruments. You tell us when we're more generous with what we give. Shape us into a people more faithful to your word, a people more, more full of joy and good news, more ready to speak out against the things that break your heart, Father God. And then to share the good news and joy and gentleness and respect. But you lead us, Father God. So we invest in you so that you would give us the words and your timing to join into what you would have us speak out on, Father God. We dedicate everything we do, we dedicate our lives to you, your kingdom work. Bless the lives of all your children and the church proclaimed, amen. I don't have too many announcements. Um, there are connection cards in the pews if you wanna fill them out with your phone number, email address, we don't sell the information, we don't disperse it. If you want, uh, we, we can put it in the directory so that we can contact each other. And also there, I, I send out a weekly newsletter. The pastoral update is what it's called. It's just information about the church, the devotion, what's going on, what we're praying for in the days ahead. Uh, people online, if, if, if you want to be a part of those lists or in our directory, email me, pastortrip at Greenwoods Church. Dot com, and we'll get you in the directory and get you the information you need. Uh, the minutes are posted online. I just updated them over the weekend. Um, we do have an interim team meeting this week. No, we don't. Um, February 9th is the next one. Continue to pray for the interim team. We need your prayers, please. Absolutely, please. Um, and I'd like to thank the interim team that's continuing to serve and walk in this interesting, chaotic time. Thank you, Jane, for taking the mantle of the, the financial crisis we're in. And we're all here for you, praying for you too. So thank you. Um, Rosa Hubbard is in the hospital. Thank you for, for praying for her. The Moran family still recovering from COVID wreaking havoc in their household. Um, anyone else have? Rick's stepmother yes. passed away, and so they'll they won't be with us for another month. Right, this is going to delay their coming back. Their return. Yeah. So um, keep that family in prayer. Right. Yeah, and I think Carrot and the kids are still in Mexico, so pray that they get back safely. Um, so, well, we have a closing song. Let's stand as we're able and sing. Drowned and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ, I stand. i 
darkness lay then bursting forth in the glorious day up from the grave he rose again he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me Finally, brothers and sisters, aim for restoration. Comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Go in peace. Never been a 